Well, when I was a kid, um, I kind of listened to a lot of music uh, through what my parents used to play. Uh, and at the time, I kind of used to hate a lot of it. I especially remember hating Neil Young as a child. Like, my dad would put it on and I'd be like, what is this horrible, depressing music? And now you're in a Neil, cover, a Neil Young covers band. Yeah, exactly. And now, now I absolutely love it. But, um, yeah, I think it was when when I was about 13, I think I bought uh, Dookie by Green Day. It was my first CD that I bought. Um, and then I sort of got into, you know, Nirvana. Um, and then and then kind of like a lot of heavier stuff like Slayer. Um, and then I guess when I sort of stopped being so angsty as a teenager, I started listening to like Warp Records, like a lot of uh, electronic music by like Aphex Twin, uh, Plaids, Square Pusher. Um, and that's kind of, I guess the sort of mixture of two is kind of like the two separate sort of loves I've had over the years. Uh, ooh. That was intense. Um, what's the question again? Uh, my my musical background. I, I got into Blur when I was about 12. And then the Smiths and then Radiohead and all those big guitar bands. And um, Sonic Youth at the drive-in, yada, yada, yada. And then when I was 18, 19, I had an epiphany where I realized that guitars sucked, uh, which, is, which is ongoing. Um, I got into DJing and house music, which poisoned my mind. I've never been the same since, but uh, then accidentally I found myself in Foles and I had to apologise for everything I'd ever said about guitars. <laughs> and here we are today. There really isn't actually. It was, um, we had a slightly different lineup when we first started. Uh, Foles started as uh, a five piece, but it was, it was everyone in the band minus Edwin. And instead of Edwin, we had this guy called Andrew Mears, who um, was also in another band in Oxford called Youth Movies. And they were kind of they were they were working on a record, and he kind of had to choose to spend to focus his attention to that. But um, he came up with it. I think we wanted to have a name that um, that wouldn't conjure up too many like instant you know connotations or judgment. And I know there are quite a lot of animal bands out there. Um, too many. Too many. Yeah. I think I don't think it's. It's not something that's going to age too badly, and I think at the time we were just like, okay, sweet, it's one word, it's bold, um, and it's not something we're going to regret in a couple of years. So, yeah, I just went with that. Well, I used to be in a band with Yanis uh, when I was at school. Um, we used to play like kind of instrumental punk metal, kind of proggy. I, I mean, I hate I hate the term math rock, but I, that's the closest thing to kind of how to describe what it was. Um, and it was me, Yanis, and this other girl called Lena. And um, that we we played we played in that band for maybe two or three years. And he was playing in that band for a year before I joined as well. Um, and we were playing all these sort of twelve, fourteen, seventeen minute long songs. It was really complicated. And we'd find that at gigs a lot of the time it would just be a lot of people that were very much like music sort of geeks stroking their beards kind of and you know it, it felt like there was this big divide between us and the, us and the crowd and it was like this sort of exhibition or something um, and when Lena announced that she needed to leave to go to university um, me and Yanis decided to do kind of the opposite and just to set up a band that was going to be fun and it was going to be more of a mutual experience where it wasn't so much going to be a band in the crowd. It was like the idea was for us to be sort of in the middle of everything. So we started playing like house parties at a friend's house. Um, but anyway, uh, the the way it actually came together was uh, me and Yannis were already together. I went to art college and met Walter, who was on the same course. He came as kind of like this package deal with Jimmy, the guitarist, because uh, they had some like blood brothers like childhood romance story or whatever that they they had to be in they had to always include each other in their musical ventures they yeah they do everything together it's disgusting um and yanis was working with edwin at a cocktail bar yes. and and i was his manager and he disrespected me but but liked me in a in a kind of cruel way and they asked me to join the band for no particular reason uh, yeah, we just released our third album called Holy Fire, um, which we recorded last year with producers Floods and Alan Mulder, who've worked together on such uh, inspirational records as... Seminal. Seminal inspirational records as 
I can't remember any of them. Uh, Melancholy and Infinite Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness and the Nine Inch Nails. Yeah. And who else? Um, Flood's worked with you too, I mean. Yeah, I mean, between them they've worked with so many amazing people. Yeah, um, so it was a big deal for us to work with them and it worked out really well. Um, um, yeah, I think with, with this record we uh, decided to give ourselves a lot more freedom than we had in the past. Like, um, when we made Total Life Forever, the album before this, um, we kind of we kind of had this blueprint um, of what we wanted to make before we even started writing. So it kind of um, it kind of angled everything we wrote towards this sort of idea that we'd already that we'd had the, at the beginning. Whereas this time, we kind of said that we would just write and we would write whatever we felt like, even if it just wouldn't feel like it would work we'd just go with it and you know just let it all come out and it could have been a total disaster because we could have written you know um like a couple of actual metal songs and then and then some acoustic pop songs and then being like well great we've got no record and <laughs> this is weird but um i think we we came into the studio with about 19 songs and and then we kind of edit it down to the 11 that would fit together the best. Um, but it's definitely our most um, diverse record uh, because of the sort of freedom we gave ourselves with the writing. Um, it's kind of it's kind of polarised everything we've done in the past um, in that there's stuff that is like faster and heavier than anything we've done, tracks like uh, Providence and Hala. But there's also songs that are... Um, a lot more delicate and spacious than anything we've done, like uh, Stepson and Moon. So, yeah, yeah. I think we we always kind of um, go with whatever um, you know comes natural. I think we we didn't really have a specific sound in mind after the last record, but um, I think we could have potentially gone f further out after Total Life Forever. In that Total Life Forever was a lot more. Um, in a lot of ways experimental and sonically sort of um, lush than the first record and if we'd have carried on going we, we might have ended up making a post-rock record or something so we were you know we, we didn't want to do that um, you know the the goal within the band has always been to kind of um, to make music that communicates with as many people as possible but without compromising the integrity of what, what we want to do um, and I think you know we're very aware when we're being self-indulgent and I think we, you know, we wanted to make sure that that didn't happen. Mm. Yes, no, I agree. <laughs> well, uh, music videos have always been a really important aspect of the band. Um, you know, when we first started, we always wanted to make sure that we had a lot, a lot of control over all aspects so that, you know, it was one kind of aesthetic and one vision was unified across all the different sort of medium so you know our music videos artwork music everything would be connected so we worked with um, a lot of friends um, and we made a lot of friends through doing this uh, Dave Ma is like our long-term sort of uh, video director he's done nearly all of our music videos over the last um, six years or whatever and um, you know him him and Yanis work really well together um, and that they sort of bounce ideas off each other um, and this year, well, last year we did a, a video with Nabil Elderkin, who is uh, an amazing um, director. He he sort of he's worked with a lot of people that are way bigger than us, like Kanye and uh, Frank Ocean, and I think he he wanted to do something really um, really cinematic with Late Night. Uh, so Yanis and uh, Nabil kind of came up with this concept between the two of them. Uh, and then we went out to Romania last December to shoot it and um, yeah it was really amazing it, was, it felt like we were sort of working on a feature film or something like we, we were working in this actual um, set and um, and the sort of atmosphere out there just felt very um, in keeping with, with the, the sound of the song so yeah um, the name came about through a sort of a process of brainstorming essentially uh, there were a lot of different ideas and it was one that stuck I think it encapsulated a lot of kind of visual I wouldn't say visual it just has like a lot of passion and um, abstract energy behind it uh, which I think means it works very well for an album title because the album doesn't have a concept it's quite eclectic um, there isn't really one unifying thing to it but we like the words holy and fire together 
Uh, and I think it's a coincidence that the that it works so well with the album album artwork, which Yanis found in a was it National Geographic? Yeah. He was just reading, like flicking through, and it was a photo that jumped out at him. And um, it didn't really occur to me at the time how well it works with the album title, yeah. but with them kind of facing into this into this invisible sunset. Um, I think the like, album title as well. Uh, a lot of the time, we get asked if it's kind of a religious thing. Um, but I kind of like the fact that it's sort of um, it's like ambiguously sort of spiritual sounding. It's like so people can take away what they want essentially from it. Um, you know, we're not a religious band, um, but you know, I don't know where I'm going with this. <laughs> yeah. Ah, um, well, we're really excited to be playing Toronto tonight. We've we've always had a lot of fun here. Um, I think the last several times we always we've always seemed to come back to Sam's Palace. I think is it Sam's Palace, Lee's Palace, mm. shit, faux pas, um, and that place is great. And yeah, yeah, Bob's your uncle's palace. No, um, and that um, that's always been really really good fun. And the um, the crowds here and the crowds in Canada like overall seem really like good and enthusiastic. Like we played Montreal last night and um, I like the crowds back home. Though. Yeah that it's uh they they're wild it was cool um and um yeah i think we we've, we've we've been on a bit of a run now this is the fourth show in four days um and it's at that point that we start getting a little bit more crazy and like it picks up a bit more steam so i think maybe uh yanis is going to unleash the inner devil tonight perhaps hopefully um but yeah no uh, i think we'll be playing quite a lot of um a lot of songs and we, we'll play <laughs> sort of linear yeah sort of linear one fashion one, we'll, we'll one after the other um we always used to joke actually about um about having a set list where we've just got a mystery song somewhere in the middle and no one knows what it is and we just click four into the song and everyone just has to has you, to guess you have to start you yeah you have to, to start, start. so it's like one two three four and then it's like <laughs> well let's see what happens <laughs> um I mean, the obvious thing with Foles was probably playing the Royal Albert Hall a couple of months ago. Like, it was a big, grand thing for us to do. It's an amazing place in London. Um, it's like, uh, how old is it? Maybe 100 and something it's years, old. Like 7, years old? It's just 7,000 years old. Yeah. It's a, a stunning, <laughs> stunning amphitheatre carved out of a cave underneath London. <laughs> no, that's not true. But yeah, it was a big, big privilege to play there. It was an amazing place. Um, it was one of those shows where, you know, all our parents come and clap us on the back and we all feel really proud of ourselves. And then we go home and feel terrible the next day. Um, aside from that, I don't know. I mean, I, m my memory isn't really functioning anymore, long, long term or short term. So it's all just day to day, isn't it? Just day to day grind. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a really, it's a really tough one. I find that, um, like, on years that we're touring, there, there's like maybe four or five moments, like just specific points in a year where. I just feel like I'm getting that sort of um, tingles down the back of my neck and I'm just like, this is fucking awesome. Like I, I, I had it a few years ago, we played at a festival in Corsica um, and it was just like, I think this, it was, this, I mean, it's, it's so cheesy, but like the sun was setting, we were sitting on the beach drinking like champagne or something ridiculous. And um, and then I was just like, this, this, is, this is great. And then we're gonna get to play later and then we're gonna get to party afterwards. And then we have two days off here or something. Um, and then sometimes you see a band and it's just like, you just see them at the exact right point. Um, and it's just like the most exciting thing. Um, I saw The Whitest Boy Alive at a festival in Belgium called Door um, a few years ago. And it was just at the right time of day. And they just played this start to end set of just dance music. And it was like the most exciting thing I'd ever seen. Cause it's, all, it's a totally live band. They've got a keyboardist who like picks up his keyboard and plays it almost like a guitar. Um, yeah, yeah, in, in in the best possible way. Um, also, we were in New Orleans a couple of weeks ago, played a show there for the first time, and I went out and experienced what New Orleans is all about. I was a little bit cynical, and it blew my, like actually blew my mind, uh, which hasn't been blown for a long time. That sounded really bad. Since. I haven't found it since. <laughs> um, I saw this guy called um, Will Blades, with one L, W-I-L, dubious name, but playing the Hammond organ playing like proper jazz walking bass lines with his feet and then all the stuff up here and it was killer and uh, it made me love music for about half an hour but then I stopped again <laughs> not really so I only like jazz nowadays <laughs> wow 
wow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I guess I life is... a uh, definition of what life is. I thought this, the official definition is life is a series of unfortunate events, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> oh, man, I don't know. I mean, mayb maybe... Maybe if we could go and smoke some weed and come back in half an hour, we'd have a better answer for you. Um. <laughs> <laughs> what is life? What is life? Um, uh, uh, I think we're in the process of working out what life is. We're very privileged to be young, so well, we don't... Youngish. Youngish. Um, I suspect in 20 years' time I will realise that life was all the stuff I was supposed to be doing. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. We, I mean, we we live like um, a constant life of uh, there's no uh, sort of development psychologically for us on tour. So we're gonna we're gonna come away from this in in five years time or whatever or one year's time or tomorrow or however long this lasts. Um, exactly the same mental state we were when we started, which for me I was uh, a student, so there was nothing there to begin with. So. So it's going to be a, it's going to be an interesting experience when you know all our friends are married with children and have mortgages and um, I'm downing Jaeger bombs by myself <laughs> in an alleyway somewhere. <laughs>